Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergio. And uh, thanks to the organizers for letting me come here. I came here a long, long time ago, and what I remembered, I'm so sorry, only the blackboards in the toilets. So I went to check, and they are still there. So I'm very happy to be back. Thanks, my friend Atanas also. OK, so I, I want to really talk uh, to go to talk, well, beyond Riemann. So I want to go to, uh, it's a very elementary lecture. It's like, I should start like Alexander. It's a very elementary and basic lecture. And I want to go to Coase's version of the curvature and try to show uh, some theorem, hopefully. Right? Or if not, it doesn't matter. And uh, OK, so it's a joint work with the regular guys, whom you can see here. And it's related to uh, so-called bishop Gromov's inequality, which was addressed sometime uh, in, in previous lectures. Uh, OK, good. It's going to be a mess here. So let, let, me, let me start by recalling the uh, classical case of uh, this uh, inequality, which is very important in the landscape of uh, Riemannian geometry. And then I should put this on, and now it does work. OK. So, uh, so the classical uh, version of uh, uh, bishop Gromov's inequality is on a complete Riemannian manifold. And uh, it's related to uh, some curvature, which is the Ricci curvature, which I, I, I guess you all know. But let me recall the, the point. So you take a manifold, and, and, and G is the Riemannian metric, and uh, sigma is the sectional curvature, and the Ricci curvature is some average of sigma. So the good thing about Ricci curvature is it's the same object and the metric, so you can compare to the metric. This is what is, makes it uh, a very strong uh, notion of curvature. Very important notion of curvature. OK, so you average uh, the sectional curvature. Well, it's not an average, it's just a sum uh, on all planes. And um, right. And, and later, I will use this abuse of language. I will say that Ricci is greater than, than kappa if uh, for all unit vectors, yeah, I, I forgot unit, for all unit vectors v, the Ricci curvature estimated as a quadratic form on this vector is greater or equal to kappa just to make sure that we, we agree on the notation. Right, so um, I need, so, so, so the idea of co on comparison theorem is always the same. You, you compare a situation on a manifold with some curvature bound to a situation on a constant curvature manifold, which is some kind of weakness somehow, because we would love sometimes to compare to non-constant curvature, but this we don't know how to do at the moment. So X and kappa is a simply connected uh, manifold of constant curvature kappa, and B kappa N of R is the volume of balls of radius R in this manifold. The center doesn't matter because it's completely uh, invariant by isometry. Right, and so the um, Bishop and Gromov theorem, so they, they did it separately, while well, Bishop did a version and Gromov extended it, is the following. So if, if one takes a complete Riemannian manifold of dimension greater or equal to two, with, whose Ricci curvature is bounded below, so the n minus 1 is just some kind of normalization here, and kappa may be negative. <coughs> then we can compare the ratio of volume of balls as it is written here. So volume of big balls divided by volume of small balls is less than the same quantity with the same radii on, on the comparison manifold, constant coverage. So it's called bishop Gromov. I think Bishop had a version of this before Gromov. And you should look at this book, Bishop Crittenden which is about Riemannian geometry, but, 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 but the balls were subject to, to, to stay inside the injectivity radius. And Gromov explained how we could go outside. So there is no limitation on the radii here. You can, you can, you can go beyond the injectivity radius, which is a good thing, actually. And, and there is some equality case, but, but it's not the purpose of this lecture to be uh, talk about equality, but just for the sake of completeness, I mentioned it, right? X, no. A priori, no. If, it, if it's closed, you, you, uh, after the diameter, you don't get any information. Right. <coughs> and, and so what, what's the use of this? And let me mention uh, a couple of results uh, which shows that it is useful uh, for, for, for some topological issues. And that will uh, be an idea that I will keep up to the end of, of, the, of the lecture. So. Um, 
So let, let me make a, a let me go to a coarser version of the uh, of the curvature. So instead of Ricci curvature bounded below, I will work with packing up balls. So here's the definition of a epsilon packing. Well, the manifold is supposed to be compact here, closed, just to for simplicity. You could do this on non-closed manifold. Uh, and so a packing is just a, a family of balls. Of radii, uh, of radius epsilon here, and, and, and they are disjoint. Nothing fancy. But of course, you try to find the, the best one, which is the largest, with the packing with the largest number of balls. And, and pack of epsilon is, an, is the number of, the maximal number of, of, uh, of balls that you can put of radius epsilon in this manifold so that they are disjoint. And of course, because the manifold is compact, it's the number which is uh, finite. Right, and, and this is a, a trivial inequality. Uh, so if you, write, if, if you write the volume of the manifold, so volume of the big manifold is just the volume of the ball of radius diameter of the manifold, because the ball of radius dia diameter covers everything. Then uh, since the, the manifold is, is uh, so this volume is, is greater than the sum of the volume of these balls of radius epsilon, and if I, I, I take the, the, the max or even, uh, sorry, the max of this, I get an, an upper bound on the packing number. So the, the, the packing number can be controlled by, by volume. This was an idea that Gromov insisted on. Volume allows to control some, some topological invariant, and we'll see later more precise statement. Right? And with the comparison theorem that I mentioned, we get an, an upper bound. Uh, if the Ricci curvature is bounded below by uh, minus and minus one. Here, kappa is equal to minus one. So this is a very trivial example, but then we, we, we can take this packing number as a good replacement of, of the Ricci curvature, a coarse version of the curvature. That's what we will, did, we will do later. Right. Well, the proof is obvious. Let me skip that. Uh, uh, Ah, sorry. So let me skip the, uh, this idea. So I, uh, I, I want to show some compactness. I want to, to explain some compactness uh, result on the space of Riemannian manifold. And so I have to explain what is the gromov hausdorff distance. Probably uh, all of you know, already know that, but, let, but, but, but if I, I skip this slide, I will be completely lost in my talk. So let me, let me just <laughs> talk about it. So, so I, I, I gave a, a, some kind of personal definition of, uh, of uh, Hausdorff, gromov hausdorff distance. So if, you take, if one takes two metric spaces, um, uh, I think, it's, I, I, think I, I should add compact because otherwise it's not uh, really interesting. And we say that the gromov hausdorff distance between them is less than epsilon. If one can find epsilon over three nets, Rx and Ry, with a bijective map between them so that these inequalities this inequality is satisfied. So a net is just a, a set of points so that the ball of radius here is epsilon over three. The ball of radius epsilon over three are disjoint. And so you, you, you may find one on x, one on, on y, and, and if there is a bijection between them, maybe you should add some, some ball somewhere. And if this inequality is satisfied, we say that the, the manifolds are close. And epsilon over three, so there is a standard definition. You can check that this one is equivalent to the most standard one. That's why there is epsilon over three here. Anyway, it's uh, it's um, so, no, no the, the balls of radius epsilon over three uh, centered at, at the point in the nets. The nets are finite here. If I assume that the spaces are compact, they 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 are disjoint. So if you double, if you take the best one, and if you double, it covers. Right. Uh, then, so the, this define uh, uh, topology, metric topology on, on so th these words I forgot to put here, compact metric spaces and length metric spaces, just to, to make sure that I'm on the safe side. So what is a length metric space? When, when you have a distance on a, on a space and you take a, a, a continuous curve, you can define the length of the curve just by subdivision. This length might be infinite, but if the distance between two points is the infinum of the length of curve, continuous curve joining this point, we say that the space is a length space. 
So I, I just stick to this situation. The, 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 the thing is more general. And, and inside metric spaces, I can take a closed uh, Riemannian manifold with a lower bound on the Ricci curvature, the same than before. I mean, kappa is equal to minus one just as a normalization, and with finite diameter bounded above by D. And the, the pre-compactness theorem says that this, um, this space M man up to, uh, of manifolds up to isometry is, is relatively compact in, in the space of metric spaces for this DC. So here everything is compact, so relatively compact, pre-compact is more or less the same. Well, it is the same. You don't have to worry about this. So compactness theorem are very interesting because it says that anytime you have um, uh, a continuous invariant on this space, then it has a lower bound or an upper bound or whatever bound you want to get. And, and, and this make uh, at least give some, some, some information. So, so why is it true? Well, let me just say that a subspace of the space of metric, of, of compact metric space, length space, is, is pre-compact or, 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 or relatively compact if this pack epsilon is uniformly bounded on this subspace Q here. So for every metric space in Q, this pack epsilon is bounded by the same number for every epsilon, well, for every member of, of Q, but of course this number depends on epsilon. As soon as you get this, then, then the, the subspace Q is relatively compact. And, and, and again, here we show that this pack was uniformly num, um, bounded because the, this bound on the Ricci curvature and on the diameter gave by, by Bishop Gromov this uniform bound, which of course depends on epsilon. Right, so, so this is the first, uh, so this is very, very classical. So it's, it's, it, it goes back to, I don't know. At least I've learned it in the book by Gromov, but it was written in the 80s. So, of course, uh, you are too young to have known this time. Right. Uh, then, 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 then this suggests that some invariant, topological invariant, might be bounded above or below, depending on the invariant. And then came this uh, uh, result, uh, which was proved uh, firstly by, by Gromov, and then uh, Gallo, my, one of my collaborators, gave a, an, an alternative proof, which I will not mention here, which says that uh, in this situation, then the first Betty number is bounded above by a quantity depending on n and d, uh, on d is the diameter. And, and of course, the manifold, uh, the curvature is normalized so that Ricci curvature is bounded below by minus n minus one times the metric. I don't put this kappa, otherwise it would be in the constant. Okay, so so in the sequel, I will I will describe I will be forced to describe the proof by Gromov, which is purely combinatorial somehow. But uh, what what Gallo uh, did at the time, he he, he would study. Um, so it was a, a study of the Laplacian, of the distance function. So he used analytic tools to get uh, this uh, kind of bound similar to Gromov. Uh, in, 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 the, in the second, I will, I will discuss the extension of these two metric spaces and this analytic tool we don't have at end. And it would be nice to try to develop analytic tools in this situation, but we don't know how to do it. Anyway, this is kind of simple, and I will mention that later. Right. So, generalization to metric spaces. Yeah, very quick, very good. Uh, yeah, so, so I. I I do not want to discuss extension to any kind of metric spaces, since first of all, it would not be true. And also, it's, we would face very complicated situation. And I say that this talk should be elementary. So let me restrict the class of, of uh, metric spaces that I will be considering. In fact, as usual in this story, we, we will talk about metric measured spaces. First of all, they are supposed to be proper. So proper just means that they are locally compact. Those balls are compact. So you exclude uh, Hilbert spaces, for example, which somehow is a pity, but but the thing would not be true in that context. Uh, and, and measured means that there is a measure mu. So more precisely, yeah, uh, I think the, the, the definition comes later, but you, you take any uh, locally finite, well, finite Radon measure or Borel measure, rather Borel measure, 
on the space X. And, uh, and then we define this notion of doubling, C doubling at some scale. So we need a measure because we will, it's not a Riemannian manifold and we will replace volume by measures of balls, right? So we need a reasonable measure. I will, I will comment this a bit later. I will give you examples. So a doubling property is just an inequality like this, means that balls of radius twice, of a radius twice the radius of R here, and if you compute the, the ratio, then it's bounded. So the volume doesn't grow too quickly, right? So it's a, it's a natural uh, assumption, and in fact, it's, of course, a consequence of a low bar on Ricci curvature because of this gromov lawson uh, Grom oh, I'm sorry. Of, of this Gromov-Bishop Grom uh, Bishop Gromov inequality. Um, yes, I have been discussing gromov lawson results uh, last week with colleagues, so that's why I'm completely uh, ups upset by, by this. Yeah, and uh, right, so, so this is doubling. So if you double the radius of the ball, then the ratio between the two measures is bounded, so it doesn't grow too quickly. Somehow it's like... Uh, Polynomial growth. So I have I have some some extra assumptions. So usually you ask this for all radii, but here we, we can restrict ourselves to uh, radii in some range. So we say C double C doubling at scale R zero, which is strictly positive. If if the radii for all radii between R zero over two and two R zero, right, in some range around R zero, reasonable range, we have this inequality. I added this, of course, because if the, the, the measure of this ball is zero, then it could not be true. And, and you'll see later that this, we will be interested in, in measures for which this could be zero. And for example, if you have a sum of Dirac mass as a measure, which is a case which is extremely interesting, we'll explain later. Right. And this should be true for every x. So this is the C doubling at scale R zero, which is much weaker then the classical doubling condition, which supposes one for every R, and also it's, it's, it's much weaker to, um, than uh, Ricci curvature bounded below. And, and so it's another coarse version of the curvature, and, and the question is what can we do with that? So, um, uh, yeah, so here is a, another remark. So the local geometry is not concerned by this doubling. So everything could happen locally in small balls. So, Okay, so if the Ricci curvature is bounded below, thanks to bishop Gromov's inequality, then we get a doubling at every scale R0, and we can even compute the constant. So what is, what, what is the good thing about this doubling over there? Well, the, 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 the good thing is, uh, yes, yes, yeah. But here, the, the, the range is uh, relatively compact, so the constant should be here, independent. But the, the problem is when you go to infinity or close to zero. Right, so we will, um, uh, so I come back to this Betty number estimate. So let me uh, recall that we are working with compact length space, and, and we assume that this metric space has a, a, a universal cover. Well, it's not always the case, but uh, in, in most of the interesting situation, it's true, and and we and with a we, which is a metric, a metric space also. Um, so what I have in mind in with metric space are CW complex complexes, for for example. Right. So um, so what? Ah, okay. Um, so here are the assumptions. We assume that the space X, which is compact, has a diameter, which is bounded by some number D. Of course, it is bounded, but this number D will come into the story later. And we assume that the universal cover carries a measure mu, which is invariant under the group action, deck transformation, and, and, and such that, well, this X tilde, D tilde, and mu is C doubling at some scale R0. And then, can prove an estimate of the first Betty number. With the, so you should not care about these fancy numbers. What is important is, is to see D appear and, and R0 in the denominator. 
So for example, if, if this R0 goes to zero, so the range on which we have doubling becomes smaller and smaller. So there is no way we should get an estimate of the Betty numbers. So the, the estimate goes to trivial B1 bounded above by infinity. No. Uh, so if R0 is big enough, then in this, this annulus in the universal cover covers a fundamental domain. So we get lots of information. So somehow if R0 goes to infinity, then only the 40 remains. Maybe it's 41 or 39. So we no. It's in the universal cover. Ah, that, that was your point. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. Never mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but 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 you are you are somehow you are right because it's R zero is greater than D. It's probably this annulus between R zero over two and two R zero covers the fundamental domain. Yes. Uh, not not right now, but I have to think a little bit more. Yeah, independent, without the assumption, of course, yeah. Without this, uh, it's difficult to find an example without this uh, doubling property, to be honest. So it's like when you draw a triangle, it's always uh, isosceles. So if you pick a random uh, metric space, then this should be true for some other. Well, I don't have any example to show you right now. Any other question? Okay, yes. Ah, okay. Ah, the screen is. Uh, and I have to do something. Ah. Ah, okay, good. Ah, good. Uh, all right. Uh, so, so I, I, I can, I can check the proof, sketch the proof, right? And and so for, forget about the numbers. But the idea is the following. Uh, if, if you look at the map from the fundamental group to, uh, to, to the uh, first homology group, uh, yeah, what you want is, is count the number of generators of this homology group. So you, you can say yourself, if I, have the, if I control the number of generators of the fundamental group, then of course I control the number of generators of this. So. But, but, but this number of generators could be very big. Maybe it's a way to answer to your question. So, so in, in general, if you, we just stick to that, it does not work. But, but now the remark is that if you take a, a subset, a finite subset in the fundamental group, which generates a subgroup, or it does generate a, a subgroup, which has finite index, then the same is true. So in other words, if S is a finite subset such that uh, the subgroup generated by S as finite index in gamma, then the image of S by this map also generates the vector space H1 XR. It's like 2Z generate R as well as Z itself, right? So we can, we can look for good <laughs> subset S, make sure that they generate a finite index subgroup, and, and we have to make sure also that we can count the number of generators, right? Okay, so let me explain how we, well, that's what I said. So let me explain how we construct such a set. It does not come from us. I mean, it was already known by Gromov long time ago. Um, uh, we, we take, uh, so we look at a ball of, of some ball of radius R, and, and, and we construct, uh, we look at a subset of, of the group whose uh, displacement, displacement at any point where the center of the ball is bounded above by this number, and then R will choose to be equal to R0 over two. So the point, there are enough points inside the ball of radius R, so the orbit of X has enough point, and we take only this point, but we, we want some kind of sparsity because we don't want to generate the full group. So sparsity is, is, is here, appears here. So the orbit, we take only the points of the orbit which are far away, well, far away is measured by 2R. 
So it's, it's, so, and we take R to be equal to this. So it's an easy exercise to, yeah, I, I'm sorry, it's in, in the universal cover. Yeah, I should have put universal cover here. Sorry, it's one of the mistakes that I forgot to, to clean yesterday. But anyway, um, uh, anyway, uh, so we get a, a finite set because in this board there are only, the, the action of the group is proper, so there are only finitely many uh, points of the orbit. We get a finite set, but this finite set is, is sparse. So the, 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 we take only points of the orbits which are far away. And it's not difficult to show that it generates a subgroup which is clear, but that is a subgroup of a finite index because we take a maximal family of, of sets like this. So among all the sets S which satisfy these two inequalities, there is one which is maximal in terms of number of elements. Well, one or several, I mean, it could be several. So we take a max, maximal in this sense, and then this gives a, a, a set S, which generates a finite index sum. So finite index is very easy to prove, and then we use the doubling property to, to control the cardinality. So we, we, we go from 2D plus 2R to 2D plus 3R, because the ball centered at gamma X of radius R might go out of, of, the, of this big ball here, right? And, uh, and, and since we are looking only at ball on the orbit and the measure is invariant, all, all these uh, ball of radius R around gamma X have the same uh, measure, right? And, and this gives this upper bound here, and the doubling property tells you that, uh, well, the C is for four and 2R0, 2R0 and R0, R0 and R0 over 2, so it's, it's CQ. So we get a bound uh, in this way. Yeah, it's supposed to be independent on R0. So you may have a thin layer where, where the doubling constant does not depend. Well, it depends on R0, I mean, if you, you can take the upper, it's a compact, uh, between R0 and uh, R0 over 2 and 2. No, 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 R0 is fixed here, right? Okay, so, so this construction is, is very classical and one has to, to, to work a little bit to check this. Okay. Okay, so we, we, so we get um, easily... Uh, this, this, this technique here is... is, is in, yeah, it's proved by Gromach, but it, it was no long time before, a long time ago. I mean, we can, you can find it in, uh, no, even before in Murray Gerstenhaber, also in, in the book by, by Jean-Pierre Serre, uh, Trees, Amal, uh, Tree Amalgam, and, and, and SL2, he, he has some kind of things like this. So if, if, but, but here, the, you use the distance to have a, a maximal family of such things. Yeah. Right. So let me move to um, the, the thing I wanted to, to really to talk about, which is uh, Bishop Gromov from Gromov hyperbolic spaces. So let me recall quickly what a Gromov hyperbolic space is. Um, so uh, look at a proper space, and, and, and uh, such a space is said to be geodesic. So it's a length space. We assume it's a length space, but uh, a geodesic in this space is just a curve that satisfies this uh, equality. Right? And, and so geodesic in this story are minimizing for every size of the geodesic, not only locally, like in Riemannian geometry. And the space is said to be geodesic if x and y, for each x and y, there is a, a geodesic joining x and y. I'm not saying unique at all, I mean, it's just one, at least one geodesic. So, so then, um, then uh, a proper geodesic metric space is delta hyperbolic if all delta, uh, if all triangles are delta thin. So this is a standard picture that I stole on the internet. I mean, I'm too lazy to, to draw picture on the computer, so I, I find it quicker to pick it on the internet. So, so please don't, don't tell anybody. And uh, I don't like it, but uh, so what, what, the, what does this thinness mean? It means that uh, you see any point on one side of the triangle, so take, what is a triangle? It's three points. And geodesic running the points. When you give yourself three points, there might be several triangles because the, the geodesic may not be unique. But you choose one triangle, and it should be true for all of them, 
any point on one side should be a distance less than del delta of, in, of, of the union of the two other sides. That's a, a definition. It's not a, the best definition in the world. In fact, uh, I learned this stuff thanks to Athanas, because he wrote a book with his collaborators, Thomas Delzon and Michel Cornart, introductory book on, on uh, hyperbol hyperbolicity in the sense of Gromov. And, and for me, the best, the best definition is about quadrilateral. The quadrangle inequality, whatever. But this, this is uh, visual. And, and this delta plays the role of uh, curvature. Uh, okay, so, so the shape that you see here is typical of uh, triangles in negative curvature. So this delta says somehow that there is some negative curvature. Of course, this property here is always true for small triangle by compactness. The space is proper. So it makes sense only for large triangles, right? And so it says that in the large, it has some negative curvature. So if delta goes to zero, then, then all triangles are tripods and the space is, is a, a tree. And if delta goes to infinity, then, then you reach flatness somehow. Because in R2, triangles do not satisfy this property. So the, the degenerate case is when delta goes to infinity. right? But as I said, there is a better definition, which I don't want to I do not want to mention here, but um, it's a much better one. So the, the good point is that it is a coarse, a coarse version of negative curvature in the sense that it does not give any information about the local geometry and topology. Right. Then we need, uh, we need something else. Um, so again, uh, we take a proper geodesic space, and now, it's, now X will stand for the universal cover. There is a group acting, discrete subgroup acting so that the quotient is compact and, and we'll use the diameter of the quotient. And we assume that on X there is a locally finite non-trivial gamma invariant Borel measure. And then every time we have these data, as we can define an invariant for, which has been, which we have been thinking of for the last uh, 30 years, 35, 35 years, which we call entropy because uh, in some, in some contexts, it's related to the topological entropy of the geodesic flow in negative curvature. And it's just the, the, the growth, it's related to the growth of volume of balls. Here it's a metric space, so volume is replaced by this measure. So you, the, the, in negative curvature, essentially the growth is exponential and, and it's exponential some constant time r, and you want to capture the constant, and this is the definition. So I, I, I wrote it as a limit, but because there is a compact quotient, does not depend on x, does not depend on mu, and it's really a limit because there is compact quotient, so it's a simple uh, version of this invariant. And it's not difficult to check that if a Ricci curvature is bounded below, then this, this invariant entropy is bounded above by a constant related to the bound on the curvature. It, 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 it comes into play in only in the fact that the, there is a compact quotient, and hence that this does not depend on x. Not depend on x is trivial, but not depends on the measure, and, and it's really a limit. But it does not come to play in, in, in these remarks here. As soon as you have a compact question, then you can, you can write this down. And the measure, of course, is invariant by gamma, which makes sense. Okay. Right? So, so for us, entropy bounded above is a really very coarse version of Ricci curvature. So, so our goal was to replace Ricci curvature bounded below by entropy bounded above in some of results which I will mention at the end. And, and of course, this is an asymptotic invariant. And Ricci curvature is, is a, a, a ten, a Ricci curvature is a tensor, so it's infinitesimal invariant. So we have to understand the local geometry with this asymptotic invariant. And this is the most difficult part of uh, the stuff. Well, the less easy. Uh, yeah. Okay, so just a definition to simplify the statement of the theorem. We will look only at group acting on a proper metric space, acting by isometries faithful, uh, faithfully, properly, and co-compactly, which we call geometric action. It's a standard uh, denomination. And, uh, and, and the one measure that we are interested in is this one. So now 
gamma comes into play. In this X, which stands for universal cover of its caution, the group acts co-compactly on a proper space, and it is discrete. So in, in balls of radius R, there are finitely many points of the orbit. And so we, we can just use the, the counting measure on the orbit here. And for every bounded domain, it gives a finite measure. But of course, for some, it gives zero if you miss the orbit. So it's not one measure. There is a measure for each point x. So, so this allows me to come back to the, the, the result where I, I, I assume that the measure of a ball was not zero. Here it could be zero. Right. And, and so I, our main result is, is this one. So, so if, if, uh, if group gamma acts geometrically on a delta hyperbolic space, so delta is here, entropy is bounded by H and diameter is bounded by D, then, then this, I love the numbers. I mean, I should have put constants here. These are completely irrelevant, but I just like to put the numbers here. Right? So, so this is, what is it? This is... Um, this is a bishop gromov inequality in this context, which is very strange if you think to that. We are in negative curvature somehow, and, and bishop gromov inequality is related to lower bound of Ricci curvature, and it's more efficient in when the lower bound is zero in non-negative curvature. Nevertheless, we were able to prove this here, and we are not able to reach the stage where there are some flatness. So I'll comment this later. Anyway, we have this inequality, which is a bishop gromov so everything is fine. It's, this is a, a ratio of distances. This is entropy times R. Entropy is like the inverse of a distance, so it's fine. Unfortunately, this 6 destroyed the optimality here, but optimality is not the in question in this story. And it is true not for all capital R and small r, radii of balls, but it's true when they are big enough. And the big is enough is control, I'm sorry, R. I'm lost. Sorry. Mm. So this is the end of the story. Okay, no, it's not yet the end. Too bad. Um, I mean, this, this you cannot avoid because this delta hyperbolicity doesn't tell you anything about the local geometry. So there is no way you can get information for small balls, right? But the, the non-smallness is reflected by this number, which is computed in terms of the three uh, datas here, D, delta. There is no H here, but H is here. Well, in fact, it's true uh, with some variation for any gamma invariant measure, but we love this one. And, and it gives some kind of doubling property, of course. If you double R, small r, then you get a, a bound which is reasonable. So this is interesting because it relates asymptotic in, an asymptotic invariant H to, to not local but, but uh, to reasonable size of balls. And so we get information from the asymptotic. But the, the bad thing is that this is a ratio. And ratio of volume of balls is not really a strong information. For example, with this, what is the volume of ball counted with this? It counts only the number of gamma, so that gamma distance between x and gamma x is less than r. So you count the number of points in gamma which, whose displacement at x is smaller. But, but the ratio is not that nice. So I will explain how to get the uh, really a, a, a good result later. So let me, in the last 10 minutes, let me, I will not give the proof, but I will show you two pictures which I, which I have not drawn myself. I mean, I asked Gallo to do it. It's even worse than me for drawing pictures. So if you see, some things are missing and so on and so forth. So, so, so this is a, a general property. If you take two balls, even in R2, when they intersect, then you can, you can fit inside a, a, another ball, the red one, whose radius is something like this. But in a delta hyperbolic space, you can do even better. You can fit a ball outside. Uh, well, if, if you think to this in R2, when the, the radii of the ball goes to infinity, then you get two planes. 
which are parallel. So you cannot fit a ball outside. If you think in, in hyperbolic space, when the radii of the ball goes to infinity, you get two orospheres intersecting. So you can fit uh, a ball outside. And this is a key point in our proof. In fact, I talked with, with Gromov, and he told me, ah, oh, yes, I wanted to take this as a definition of delta hyperbolicity at some point. You, but, but then he switched to triangles and to quadrangles, which are more visual. Right. So this is a key point in, 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 in the proof. But the, let me not explain the, the proof. It's a mess anyway. In, in, instead, I will mention a, 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 a finite uh, Nash theorem for, for hyperbolic uh, matrix space. So, so I use this notation here. And, uh, and uh, OK, so, so again, we have the, more or less the same uh, situation, delta H and D, and gamma is uh, so, so we are acting on a space capital X, which stands for a universal cover. And we look at a group which is non-cyclic and torsion-free. I'll mention this discrete subgroup. And, and the space is delta hyperbolic. Then, then, the, then this is the most difficult part of, of, of the result, that you can count, you can measure this, the size. Uh, I should have put mu. You can count the number of elements in the group whose displacement at x is less than this quantity. You can estimate this number. So it's kind of difficult because uh, you have only this asymptotic information, and you have to look at a ball of finite size. Right. OK, so, so this has a nice consequence. So if one takes um, a, a finitely generated a group, which I assume to be non-cyclic and torsion-free, and I take a, 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 symmetric, uh, a symmetric generating set sigma, then we can be, one can build the Kelly graph. Maybe I, I don't have that much time to, to de detail this. Uh, and, uh, and the Kelly graph is just a graph on which the group acts transitively. And, and the quotient of the graph is just a bucket of circles. So the diameter is one. And so the, the previous, and of course we take on, on the graph the, the counting measure, and the previous inequalities shows that, so th this graph is related to the group and, and to taking a, a generating set. So every time you have a group and a generating set, we have a graph. And, and then the previous inequality shows that we can count. So we assume that the graph has some entropy bounded by H and that it is delta hyperbolic. The diameter is one. Then we can count the number of generators that we have in this generating set, just with these data. And of course, now, uh, there is this, H is the entropy, the growth, volume growth, in the graph. You have a metric, the metric, I, I, I've been very quick. The metric is just uh, every edge has length one. And then the, the volume of ball is just a counting measure, and so on and so forth. Right, so when, when, when you have a finitely presented group and you can count the number of generators, if you can bound the size of the relations, then you can count the number of groups. Right? And it turns out that for hyperbolic group, for every generating set, you can find uh, a set of relations, a finite set of relations whose length is bounded by this number. So this is not new, I guess in your book, you have something like 100 delta or whatever. You can always bound the, the size of the relations by a number depending only on delta. It was known by Gromov, but this 4 delta plus 6 I found in the book by uh, Effliger and Wrightson and Effliger. And it's very easy to, to, to show this. Well, anyway, this shows that the number of Mach groups is bounded by, is bounded by, so, so let me say it again. I I'm, I'm realize that I'm becoming messy. So you take a delta hyperbolic group whose entropy is bounded by, by H, and, you, and, and one takes a, a generating set. Then the number of group and generating set, which I call Mach group, is bounded by something which depends only on delta and H. So there are finitely many of them. So it's a finite nice theorem which comes from all these, uh, these things. And in the last five minutes, I will explain the I, I, I will not explain the proof because it takes some time. Excuse me? The number of hyperbolic group 
of marked hyperbolic group. So delta hyperbolic group, so this is a parameter. And a marked hyperbolic group whose entropy is bounded by H, entropy is defined by the Kelly graph, so you need to have generating set. At some point, you will either destroy the entropy bound or destroy the, the delta. Yeah, this is a, the standard denomination. Mark means that you, you choose a generating set. If you have a generating set, then you have a space on which the group acts, which is a Kelly graph. Then if you have a space on which it acts, you can compute the entropy and so on. Right. So you need these two data, otherwise it's wrong. Right. Okay, so let me finish by, uh, sorry, I will not say more than, than, than this slide. So the first tool that I, we use to prove this uh, theorem is, is, uh, is our bishop Gromov inequality. And the second one is this result by Broyar, Green, and Tao, which goes as follows. So I, I simplified it for the, for the purpose of this talk. There's a fixed number C, greater or equal to one, and there is another number new, depending on C, such that for any group, here I had torsion free for the sake of simplicity. If you can find in this group a finite set which satisfies this inequality, that is the cardinality of A times A, A times A is just the subset of products of elements in A, is less than C times cardinality of A. So it's some kind of doubling property. So if you find a finite set which has this doubling property, then it is, well, this, if A would generate a, a subgroup, then this would imply that the subgroup is uh, poly, has polynomial growth. So it would be nilpotent. Here, it's just a finite set, which satisfies this inequality. So it's not nilpotent, but it's covered by fin finitely many translate of some nilpotent group in, in gamma. And this finitely many is bounded above by nu, is nu, right? So this is a bit surprising. It's true in, in full generality. And in fact, I could, I could, I could well, let me not talk about torsion free. But, but as, as if you have a finite subset which satisfies this, and it's small enough so that it's, it's, it's covered by a, a finite union of translate of a nilpotent subgroup. So it's some kind of Margulis lemma for those who are familiar with Margulis lemma. I, 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 I know that it is surprising at first glance. So, so it comes from the, the, this work by lots of people like Tim Goertz and Ushrovsky, where they try to fit in some subset of R um, arithmetic progressions. So here it's not arithmetic progressions, it's what they call nil progression. So you can fit in A because of this hypothesis, some kind of nil progression, translate of this nil potent group. Okay. Oh, well, so now if we want, so we can apply this to, because, because of our bishop Gromov inequality, we can apply this for A it equals the, the, uh, this ball of radius x, uh, um, uh, centered at x and of radius three times this number 10, del 10 times d plus delta. And, and uh, the, the bishop Gromov inequality is about a ratio. So we get this information here. So one of these balls, let me not be precise, one of these balls plays the role of this set A. Remember that the measure counts in the ball the, the number of elements whose translation at x is less than some number. And so, and so we, can, we, can, we can say that these balls are covered by the finite number of translate of an impotent group. But, but, but in, a, in a delta, forget about this, but in a delta hyperbolic group, uh, nilpotent means, uh, mean, in a hyperbolic group, nilpotent means z. So these are, are translate of, um, of cyclic groups. A is a finite. Yeah. 
Ah, okay, 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 okay. I, I went too quickly on this A. Uh, let me come back. Sorry, it's, it's, it's big messy. This is this, right? Is the element of the group whose displacement at x, we fix from x, is less than a quantity. And, and this R0 is this number which appears in the theorem. Sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm really uh, messing around everything here. Right, so, so this transform uh, uh, a ratio, a, a control of the ratio, so this doubling property into a, a structure of the space. And then the counting is done just by counting the number of elements here. And this is, is a trick uh, related to hyperbolic group. All these are translated of the same nilpotent group, so you just have to count one anyway. Um, right. Uh, so what is good, so let me finish by this remark, uh, what is good about uh, nilpotent group in uh, hyperbolic group is that they are always Z, so they are a cyclic group. Now, this A is, is, is a ball of, uh, centered at X of radius, of radius um, three, 3 R0, whatever it means, and, and you have elements of the group which di whose displacement is small. Of course, you can cover this by, by, by cyclic subgroup. You, for each element, you take the cyclic subgroup that it generates, and then you cover the, the whole ball. But what is good here, what is really amazing here, is that you have this number. You, you can cover it by a certain number which depends only on the constant here. Right? And then you have to play with this to, to, to finish. Um, okay, okay, I'm sorry I, I have been messy, but I'm... Happy, I would be happy to discuss some details if you wish. Thank you very much.